The text for the sermon this morning is Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. We'll read that again, those verses. Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. The lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in king's palaces. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know if you noticed, but all the songs that we sang have to do with wisdom, wise, being wise and wisdom. And Proverbs is part of the wisdom literature in the Bible. And that in, in Proverbs, it's a recurring theme, um, the contrast between the wise and the fool, the wise man and the foolish man. Now, with the wise person, we maybe think, first of all, of somebody who has a, in the first place, somebody who has a high IQ or so. Somebody who knows a lot, has gathered a lot of knowledge, has read a lot of books, has a lot of university degrees, maybe. And the fools are then people, um, in our opinion, maybe then people who don't have a lot of intellect or learning, haven't read much. But that's not what the Bible means with when it speaks of wisdom and foolishness. In the Bible, we meet people who are very smart and learned, but who at the same time are amazingly foolish. Great leaders who are foolish. And on the other hand, you can have very plain and simple people, everyday people, who, are, according to the Bible, are incredibly wise. And that's because wisdom and foolishness are not really about intelligence, but about your attitude and how you live practically before the Lord. So what's the difference? What's the real difference then between the wise and the foolish person in the Bible? Well, if you look at verse 32 of our chapter of, of Proverbs 30, then you see a description of someone uh, who has been foolish. If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or you've been devising evil, put your hand on your mouth, exalting yourself. A foolish person is somebody who elevates himself. It's all about him or her. Like those in verse 11 of this same chapter who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. They, they don't want to listen to their parents because they think they know better than them. They say, oh, what do, you, what do you know, mom and dad? I know what to do. I've, I've, I know what's going on in the world. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I can find my own way. And see, a fool is someone who doesn't want to listen to advice, doesn't want to listen to correction. But a fool goes by their own feelings and desires and wishes. They live in an age, we live in an age when people figure they don't need to listen to others, uh, even that there's not much to learn from history. There's a lot of foolishness in the past. You know that uh, these statutes of people of the past are being pulled over nowadays and we have to do away with the past. And today people want to go by their own feelings, emotions, Wishes, the thing to do is follow your heart and everything. And you realize from Proverbs that there's really nothing new under the sun then because that, there were a lot of people like that in Agur's days too who thought the same way. It's the attitude of the perennial fool who exalts himself and ignores reason and advice and history and goes by his own feelings and emotions he doesn't need others, doesn't need God to decide how he's going to live, what she's going to do. On the other hand, there's the wise person, somebody like Agor, who wrote the words of Proverbs 30. We don't know for sure who this man was, but if you look at the beginning of this chapter, you see that he, he doesn't boast about how smart he is. 
He calls himself, even he calls himself stupid. And notice that in the, the first verse, he, he declares to God that he's weary and worn out. And that sounds a lot like the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. The preacher tried, you know, if you know the book of Ecclesiastes, he tried to figure out how everything works in the world. If there's a, a, something that he could find the reason for all these things happening the way they do. He searched it all out, but in the end, it says it wearied him. All he can conclude is that everything is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. In other words, if I try to figure things out with my own thoughts and feelings, I'm not going to get any closer to figuring out the how and the why of everything in this world. I only tire myself out, and I have to accept that the wisdom of God is far greater than I can ever grasp with my tiny mind. That's also why the Apostle Paul writes 1 Corinthians 1 that with the gospel of the cross of Christ, God has made foolish the wisdom of the world that lives without God and shown that his foolishness is much wiser than the wisest of men. So that's the difference between the wise and the foolish person then. The fool says, I know it all. Just need to go by my own thoughts and feelings and I'll be fine. And the wise person, on the other hand, says, because of my sinful nature, I know I'm a fool of myself. And I need God's word. I need to go by the word of God. By the gospel he has made known in this fallen world. And you realize then why it says a number of times in the Bible that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We sang that in Psalm 111. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. To humbly look to God above everything you think and feel is the beginning of becoming wise in your life. In New Testament terms, to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the beginning of wise thinking and wise living. And that's what Agor already wants to emphasize in our text in the Old Testament. He uses four creatures to draw our attention to the kind of wisdom that we need to live this life in the fear of God. And with that in mind, I proclaim the text with this theme, consider the small creatures and become wise. They teach us to, in the first place, prepare for the future. Secondly, seek the safe place. Three, Stay strong with others, and finally, stay humble. So first of all, prepare for the future. So the first critter Agur draws our attention to is the lowly and the common ant. You see them all over in the summer, right, boys and girls? You see them walking across the cement sidewalk, coming out between the cracks in the sidewalk. When you walk... You see all kinds of them scurrying around. You can step on them and kill many in one step of your foot, shoe. They're busy little creatures, always looking for someone, something to take to their ant hill or their ant tunnels. Always busy, scurrying to and fro. And what, what is an ant, really? Just a tiny creature. You can put an end to their life between two fingers, and that's the end of the ant. They're certainly not a people that are very strong at all, as the Agur says in the text. But they're always busy, scurrying to and fro, summer and fall. And because that's, they're always gathering provisions for themselves, for the coming winter, they're looking ahead. Like it says, Proverbs 6, verse 6, where the lazy person is told to look at the busy ant and consider how she gathers her food and prepares it in harvest for the winter. See, Agor says, ants show us wisdom in that they do their utmost to use the time they have to prepare for the future, for the winter that's coming. They teach us a spiritual lesson in that. Use the time God gives you to prepare for times of difficulty. In fact, to prepare for when he calls you out of this life. Because that time will come. 
And in connection with that, think of the well-known words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes 12. And he's speaking there to young people then. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, in that time period. You can think of your life in terms of seasons, time periods of seasons, like spring is when you're a child. Summer, you present, that's a time you come to maturity. And the fall of life is then your senior years. And that's when life slows down. You're not able to do what you're used to anymore. Things slow down. And the winter is when you descend into the hibernation of death, so to speak. And you no longer have a place here on earth. Brothers and sisters, are you preparing yourself for that winter? While you have time here and opportunity now, are we busy now, like the ants, preparing ourselves for when the winter comes, the winter, the sleep of death? Are we using the time of youth and maturity and sonority to grow in the Lord before that time comes, the sleep of death, when the Lord calls us out of this life into eternity? The busy ants teach us not just to live for here and now, not just to seize the day, carpe diem as it's often called, but to always consider your life and how you live it in the light of where you're going in the future, what's going to happen to you in the future. The famous 18th century revival preacher Jonathan Edwards once said that he prayed that God would write the word eternity right across his eyeballs so that whatever he looked at, he would always see it in the light of eternity. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, too, we exist on this earth not just to put in some time here and enjoy ourselves here and get as much out of it as we can, and that's it. We're given this life to prepare for eternity. This life is the rehearsal for then. The dress rehearsal. Do we see our life here as time of grace to make ourselves, to prepare ourselves to live with God and with his Son in everlasting holiness and joy and glory? To live with him, our maker, and with our Savior? How, how would you prepare for that then in this life? The Bible points away. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have eternal life. That's so simple. In John 11, the Lord Jesus said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who he raised from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe that? Wondrous words of our Savior. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, do you believe those words? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, who died for you and rose again? Oh, if the ants don't manage to gather enough provisions for the winter, they're going to die. That's, that's what it's about. In the same way, if during the seasons of your life, you don't busy yourself with living faith in Jesus Christ you will die forever. So you see, the lesson of the ant is serious. It's a life and death matter. So brothers and sisters, boys and girls, seek the Lord while he may be found here. Seek the Lord Jesus Christ and live in Christ. You are righteous before God, an heir to life everlasting. Follow him who is the wisdom of God and the righteousness and salvation and redemption, as we read 1 Corinthians 1. We come to the second part, seek the safe place. The second creature mentioned in the text is called the rock badger. The word used is kind of difficult to translate. Some Bible translations have the coney here, known in Western Canada as the pika, pika. 
Topeka is a little, little animal, furry animal, lives among the rock falls, size of a little guinea pig, has a whistle to warn of danger, which you can hear when you're walking through the mountains, hiking through the mountains. And they have a lot of enemies. The greatest enemy being the eagle with its great curved beak and large talons. The eagles soar above the mountainsides and with their sharp eyesight, they look down for their favorite prey, the pika. And when an eagle sees a pika, he swoops down with talons stretched out to grab that pika behind the head and to fly away with it to a high rock where he'll tear it apart and, and eat it. You realize those little furry animals would never be able to fight off an eagle, a powerful eagle. And that's why it has its home among the, the rocks, or the rock falls on the mountain slopes. If a pika would live in the middle of a meadow, it wouldn't survive. It would get caught by an eagle. So it lives among the boulders, and when it senses danger, it whistles to warn all the pikas around with a high-pitched whistle, and, and all the pikas dive into their homes among the rocks. Sea congregation, the pika knows its weakness, and the pika knows its enemies, those two things, especially the greatest enemy, the eagle. And that's why the spirit offers the pika as an example to us of wisdom. Do we as Christians know our greatest enemies or the greatest enemy of all? Do we accept how weak we are in ourselves against this enemy? Our greatest enemy is the devil, as you know, the devil. In 1 Peter 5, the Apostle Peter even describes him as a roaring lion prowling about seeking someone to devour. So not a lion in the zoo, which you can watch from behind a high fence or, or thick bars sunning itself peacefully on a rock being fed every now and then. No, this is a hungry wild lion prowling around on the savanna in Africa. And when it sees an antelope, it creeps through the high grass as quietly as possible to suddenly pounce on its prey and kill it. You can watch all these videos on YouTube, how, how lions stalk their prey. And that's what the devil is like, too. Exactly like that. He wants to pounce on you, drag you away with him to destruction. He wants to swoop on you like an eagle, take you away and tear you apart. See, Peter and, and also Agur understood what, that's what the devil is like. Remember how just before his arrest in Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus warned Peter in particular that the devil wanted to take hold of him and make him sin and draw him away from his Lord. But Peter said to Jesus, don't worry about that. If all the others will fall away from you, I will not. I will never desert you. And there you have the attitude of the fool. You know, he thinks he's, he's able to do it himself. Exalts himself. Well, a few hours later, Peter denied his master and savior three times. He denied him when he was asked whether he was one of Jesus' disciples. He even swore an oath, I don't, I don't belong with this man. And you see how the devil got Peter. And if Jesus hadn't prayed for him, he would have been dragged to his destruction. So the devil prowls around looking for prey or circles above you in the sky like a sh sharp-eyed eagle. And not only should we know our enemies, the devil, as well as the world and our own sinful nature, as we confess in the catechism, those are the three enemies. We also have to realize and accept that of ourselves, we're so weak and vulnerable of ourselves. 
like the little pika. Think again of Peter, who was disciple, was so close to Jesus. How easily he fell. So we, we shouldn't think, oh, I can stand on my own. I can, I can resist this. We shouldn't think we can fight off our enemies on our own. We need a safe place. Like the pika among the rocks. We need to stay near the rock of salvation, Jesus Christ. Like the pikas stay near the rocks, too. We have to stay with our rock. We need to flee to him who has been given all power and authority in heaven and on earth for our protection. Where the devil can't go. Don't think you can defend yourself from the attacks of the evil one on your own. No, you have to build your house on the rock, Jesus Christ. Continually take refuge in him in prayer and, and seeking him in the gospel. Spending your time with the gospel. And he will, he will intercede for you as he did for Peter. A believer never thinks he or she can take on the temptation of the evil one on their own. They run to Jesus in prayer. And by opening his word, when temptations draw near, they know I'm so weak, but he is so strong. Their enemies can't touch them when they go to him because he's their rock of refuge, their tower, strong tower. Seek your safety with him, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. He wants you to have life, the life he obtained for you, and he wants you to have it abundantly. We'll come to the third part of the message this morning. Stay strong with others. We come to that third critter mentioned in the text, the locust. Now a locust, you might know, is a, is a much larger version of the grasshopper, which we know here, and you have them now. They're out now, grasshoppers. But locusts found in Africa, in the Middle East, and Asia, they live in huge swarms. And they move around in those swarms, and they eat everything that grows. Leaves, and everything green. Whole fields, orchards, vineyards are completely eaten bare of anything alive. A single locust, you realize, is not a problem. But they don't come in ones and twos or even thousands. They come in swarms of millions. Darken the sky, causing terror to families and farmers who know that their crops will be completely eaten up. And it's no wonder that in the Bible, great invading armies are compared to swarms of locusts marching through the land, cleaning out everything. And people know there will be famine. But the amazing thing is that while an invading army has a king and generals, has leaders that go before them and tell them what to do and where to go, a swarm of locusts has no leadership at all. No king. There's no locust that stands out and is bigger than the others and therefore the leader of all the others. Nope. They all move together in unison. And as they march together, those locusts are strong and fearsome. And see, that is how it is with the wise. When the wise person realizes that by themselves they're weak and vulnerable, then they realize they need others too. They need others, and others need them. And that stands in contrast to the modern culture of today, right? It's all about individual rights and freedoms today. You notice some of that today when, when you have to when you have some people refusing, you know, to um, submit to the government regulations or so, practice social distancing during this pandemic. It's all about their individual rights and freedoms. And if you think about it, our society today is more and more a collection of individuals with each person wanting to do their own thing. They want everyone to be left alone and to do what they want or feel. You're strong and you can make your life the way you want it to be. Nobody can stand in your way. Just follow your heart. 
live out your desires and wishes. That's the fool, of course. But as we mentioned, yes, that's the attitude of the fool, but the Bible agrees that we're all unique people, but it also shows us we need others and others need us. We're social people too. Social people who need each other. We need communion, community. That's what makes it so hard for us as, as believers too, because this is what church is about. That's what makes it hard for us today. Jesus Christ didn't die for an individual here and an individual there. No, he gave his blood for his church. And that's because he knows that we can't survive in this world on our own as Christians. We're way too vulnerable by ourselves. You can't row against the stream of our present secular culture on your own. You can't keep up the fight of the faith by yourself today. Imagine that you were a Christian on your own without church, without communion of saints. How long do you think you would be able to keep believing the Bible and living according to it? See, congregation, we need each other to guide, encourage, comfort, admonish, and help each other. That's why, why we also have the deacons, by the way. Show love for each other, that we know we need each other. And that's why our Savior instituted his church. He, he's our king, but he's in heaven. He's invisible. And yet, we're joined together and united here as his people on earth. And together, we're strong in him. And it's by his spirit and word that he now gathers, defends, and preserves a church for himself and the unity of faith. A church that will always exist. No matter how hard people do to try to wipe it out, it will always be here. And as individual believers and as individual believing churches, we seek each other out because we all need each other. And now we come to the last part of the text, stay humble. Stay humble. The last creature agar uses in the text to impress godly wisdom on us is the lizard. In warmer countries, you find lizards all over, you know, on the walls and, and so on. If you're quick, you can catch one and hold it in your cupped hands. Hold the lizard, as the text describes. Hold it in your hand. But they're not warm, cuddly creatures that you'd actually like to hold on and clutch to your heart. They're, they're cold and scaly with long tongues that flick out like the tongues of snakes. Loathsome, actually. Lowly, lowly creatures. And as Christians, we're like lizards in a certain way. There's nothing warm and lovable about us. We're poor, miserable sinners. And according to worldly standards, we're we're weak and foolish nobodies, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1. Loathsome to the world. And yet, the apostle says there, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world to, too, so that none of us might boast in the presence of God. And that's why the Lord Jesus stated more than once in the Gospels that he who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's what following Jesus Christ means. He humbled himself even to death for us. How then could we exalt ourselves and think we know better than what God says in his word about how to think, speak, and live? How to be saved in Christ. And congregation, that's why the Apostle Peter writes 1 Peter 5, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Just follow your Savior in being humble. Even if what you stand for is despised by the world, world loathed by the world what you stand for. Continue in humility with Jesus Christ, even if that means that there are others who look down on you. 
who consider you a scaly, slithery, loathsome lizard. Because in the end, you will be found in the king's palace. You will be exalted. You will, because of grace, be found in the palace of the king of kings. So the lizard tells us not to think too highly of ourselves, but to be humble in your faith, lowly. Walk with the Lord Jesus as he did. And by his grace, you will in time be found in the king's palace, in the presence of the king of kings. In conclusion, then, the spirit through agor instructs us to consider those four creatures and to become wise. Follow the gospel rather than your own reasonings and feelings. And if you do that, then you will, like the ant, prepare yourselves here for the future. You will seek safety in the rock, like the pika, and you'll stay strong with others, like the locust, and finally you'll seek to be humble, like the lizard who ends up in the king's palace. Amen.